I really, really appreciate everybody getting ready to spend an evening or not whole evening, but a part of an evening with me to talk about belugas, which you may have heard are kind of considered our canaries in our oceans. So uh, I'm not in the South Pacific. It's, you know, my background, but it's kind of a funny thing given to talk about cold water animals. But um, this is a really fun uh, animal to get to know. And so what I'll, I'll do is I'll start out very general talking about their biology, uh, a little bit of their ecology, and then sort of narrow down to talking about Alaska's um, uh, beluga populations. And then we'll go down to the Cook Inlet animals, the ones that are endangered. And then we'll go even further down to the animal that we had roaming around the uh, North Pacific, or the, I say Pacific Northwest waters up here about, uh, well, about a year and a half ago, so October of 21. So we'll go in that order. So they're classified, um, you know, of course, under the order cetacea, because they're being a cetacean, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. But interestingly, they have a little bit of a misnomer from their families. You go down in the, in the um, tree of, of uh, classification. They're considered a monodontidae uh, family member. And so mono is just one and donta is two. I mean, sorry, it's tooth. And um, which is a misnomer because they don't have just one tooth. But what they do have in this family is also the narwhals, which have that lone tusk that is a tooth that protrudes out. Sometimes they'll have two. So it's, they're very similar in their body shapes and their habitats and their um, you know, life ecology. So they got kind of lumped into one. They're the genus Delphinapterus and then the species Lucas. Now they lack a pronounced rostrum. They're not the only cetacean that does. I mean, certainly look at our southern our killer whales and our other species like our Pacific white-sided dolphins. Uh, but they do have what's, um, it's a nice round flexible uh, melon. As you can see in this lower left-hand picture, this was just a clip I took out of a video where they very gently just push down. And I have I was able to do that on a whale that we were working on in the Bristol Bay area up in Alaska uh, a few years ago. And it's, it's there, they feel like one of those mattresses that you buy that is, uh, you know, comes in a thin box and then you got to open it up and let the air, those uh, really firm uh, foam type mattresses. So it's very, very soft. So it enables them to make a lot of different uh, movements with their with their melons, and it can be you know very um, very unusual some of the movements they'll make with their melons. So it helps them focus uh, and modulate their vocalizations, including some of their echolocation clicks. And you can see by the expression on the mouth of that one animal up in the left hand corners that they are they're very expressive, so they can move their lips quite readily too, which not a lot of cetaceans can do. Um, they are a toothed whale. They do possess anywhere from 18 to 20 teeth in both upper and lower. So a uh, total of about 36 to 40 teeth. So going back to when I said that monodontidae, the one tooth is really a misnomer uh, for the family these guys belong to. So I kind of get a kick out of, um, you know, that their shape is quite odd, uh, very different from other cetaceans. And, but it's very aerodynamic. And I think uh, some of these, you know, airplanes have taken upon themselves to really imitate how these, you know, the same type of configuration. So when you're trying to move, you know, large pieces of, of airplanes as these Airbuses and Boeing uh, jets do, they really have looked to animals that live in the water. And I think they've, you know, I like the fact that they've kind of gone ahead and, um, you know, written beluga or drawn smiley faces on planes, but it's just kind of a neat deal, sort of a neat nod to the beluga whale so that we know that, yes, um, they have a great aerodynamic capability, uh, you know, they're hydrodynamic in the water for the animal, but uh, aerodynamic in, in uh, the air for the plane. So it's just kind of a funny um, thing, like a nod to the species. So the, the genus name Delphinapterus translates to dolphin without a fin. So they're not the only ones, as you know, but they are, uh, in, instead of having a fin, they have this dorsal ridge. It's a tough one. It's made of really tough cartilaginous material, fibrous material, and it allows them um, to do several things. It allows them to flow easily under ice flows, which are the floating sheets of ice, and they can crack those. They can like arch their back and, and actually push holes or at least crack the ice so they can have breathing holes. So that's kind of a neat way to um, for them to get underneath there. And because if you had a dorsal fin and you're trying to swim under ice, it would be very impractical. Uh, another interesting feature about these animals is, uh, unlike other whales, uh, they do not have um, 
fused vertebra in their neck. So the cervical vertebra are those first, we call them the C vertebra, and then you have the T vertebra, which are the thorax. But there's first like seven or so vertebra are not fused together as they are in most species. So they're able to turn their necks sideways. They can nod or look up. And I'll show you some pictures here in a minute of them doing that. So it makes it gives them a, little, a lot extra flexibility than they would normally in other species. Um, they also are covered with a thick blubber layer, which a lot of cetaceans are, but they, they have up to about 40% of their weight is composed by blubber. And so that's really important when they're living in a very Arctic cold environment and it allows them also to store energy in these uh, populate in these um, their bodies because during the winter time, it can be very difficult to find food that's available in a very harsh climate. So they're able to at least subsist on some of their, their blubber stores that they collected during the summer. And then some pop beluga populations then shed their outer skin layer of each at, um, during each summer during the annual molts so they can rub against coarse gravel and having their body shape, which I'll show you another interesting feature about it, allows them to get on that gravel and just kind of rub it and they can get rid of that you know, old layer of yellowed skin and then they'll, have, they'll come out nice and white again. They're quite big. They can be up to five meters long or 16 feet. So, um, you know, when I was out in the field standing next to an adult male, they would, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm only five foot, foot three inches tall, but they would come up to almost my waistline as far as the height from ventral surface up to the, the dorsal ridge. So they be, can be quite large animals, uh, but they're actually were quite, um, you know, I was telling these people, I was telling uh, Dareth and, and Kendra earlier before we started that, you know, personality wise, I kind of liken them to a, to a Labrador. They go through that phase of excitement when they're first caught, like a young Labrador, you know, they go that kind of crazy one to two years of age. And then they calm down, become this really nice sort of mellow laying around whale. So um, they were very pleasant to work on. They were, I wouldn't say easy because it's a very harsh climate up there in, in Alaska, but but, you know, as far as compared to something like a, a harbor porpoise, it's sort of like the chihuahua, very nervous. Um, they were quite um, a lot easier to work on. They are big animals. They can average around 3,000 pounds. I like to refer to them as sort of the, the, the um, kind of the Pillsbury doe whale. They're just, I mean, this is an animal that's got full blubber layer on and they are huge. But you can notice the neck, as I mentioned, because it's not fused, the cervical vertebra, this animal is able to look down, sort of dip its chin down a little bit. And that's very uh, different from other species. Now, these, um, I call them pontoons, these side ridges that they develop as they're gaining weight, as they're putting on blubber layers. They always have them, but they vary in size depending on how much blubber layer they have in them. So if they're uh, coming in, you know, after they've been uh, searching around for food, scrapping around for food all winter, these, these lateral ridges are going to be quite, you know, not as pronounced as they would be after like, here's one that's probably pretty pronounced. It's probably the same animal or different animal here, but this one's got a really lateral, a pronounced lateral ridge. And the purpose of these um, is not 100% clear, but there are some strong hypotheses that they may be used in uh, as control surfaces like ailerons on a plane. So there allows them to move control rolls during turns, not like over roll if they're trying to turn or um, if they're trying to swim in, a, in an inverted position, say on their back and they want to turn over real quick. So it allows them to do it without overcompensating. And there was actually a paper that was published in 2012 in the Marine Mammal Science. If you're interested, you can go back and look and uh, that's where they came up with some of these theories. So uh, during the, well, when we were up in Bristol Bay working on some of these animals during the end of the summer, they were huge. So I think they also serve as deposition areas for blubber. So, to, you know, they, they, the whole thing comes, happens. And then as they're, you know, they've got their full blubber layer on, on their dorsal surface or ventral, and then they can put the excess blubber on these lateral areas. So there may be more than one purpose for it, but um, certainly they're very interesting, make them very unique looking animals. Another interesting characteristic about them is if you were to look at them sagittally and cross section, they look like a flattened triangle. And this is very, um, very, you know, it's, good, it's easy for them to then, uh, if they have to sit out on a tide cycle, especially in the mud flats up in Alaska, then th this, this uh, configuration 
keeps them from having to fall over on one side. You know, if they were more of a deep chested animal versus like a, you know, like an angelfish type of animal. So being more flat on the ventral side allows them to be able to sit up so that when the tide does come back, they can actually get out pretty readily and not have to write themselves up. Uh, and so that, um, you know, we'll often see groups of animals that have come out, so like these animals were probably on the tide, uh, on the gravel surface may have been, you know, rubbing themselves on the tide with a calf here. But again, it allows them just to sit still. Here's another example on this left side where you can see a little bit of the, the bending of the neck. So that provides some, uh, you know, flexibility and they can look around in their, in their environment. And then here's just some more of the, the vertebrae, you know, showing how flexible these guys can get. I mean, they can turn and they can almost bend their neck at a, almost a 90 degree angle, but I think it's just quite fascinating. And, you know, when they look around at you and, and look up, uh, they don't have to move their whole body. They can just simply just turn their head up and, and look without um, having to move everything else. So they are social animals. They do return to their birth areas each summer to feed and give birth to calves. Now groups can range anywhere from one or two animals up to several hundred whales. So individuals though, say in, co in comparison to say uh, Southern residents up here, they don't tend to um, stay with just their maternal led pods. So killer whales will tend to stay with maternal led pods. They may go and visit other pods, but belugas, they will exchange you know, groups. They can go from one to the other uh, to keep that gen genetic variability going. Now, if you'll notice the top picture, this is a group of, of whale, a group of belugas have been uh, photographed quite a number of times. And if you look carefully in between the top two animals, there's a gray animal. And if you look really, really carefully, there's a, a tusk coming out. So this is a, a group of belugas. I wanna say it's been Northern Canada that's been filmed uh, with a, um, a narwhal. It's been there with them, has lived with them for quite a while, seems to fit in. So just kind of an interesting, um, you know, there may be more to the story. I don't, I don't know the, the backstory completely, but I know it showed up a little while ago and it's been with them for ever since. But anyway, they're, they're quite social animals in big groups and they will travel great distances um, within a day, just like the killer whales do. So they are, they are um, not just in one location. They are quite long lived, believe it or not, and they can live up to 90 years. It's not common, but it, ha it has been known based on aging of teeth and uh, looking at um, you know, some of their ovarian scars. And so it's a very, it's interesting for an animal that's not as large as say a giant whale or as large as even a killer whale, but, but they can be long lived. They do, um, well, it's believed that they mate in late winter and spring, so depending on the population in the world where it is, this may occur during migration or it may occur in their wintering grounds. Just depends on what population they come, for, come from. And females tend to reach sexual maturity when they're about mm, six to 14 years of age. And the males are gonna be slightly older. So similar in, you know, in humans where the males will sexually mature a little bit later than um, females. And pregnancy is quite long. It lasts about 15 months and calves will stay quite a while with their moms about uh, two years. So because of this length of nursing period, the calving intervals tend to be, or birthing intervals tend to be about every two to three years. So they won't have something every year. Um, they generally give birth during summer in areas where the water's relatively warm because when these calves are born, just like other cetaceans, they're, they're blubber layers are quite thin and they're going to be living in a, you know, compared to say a bottlenose dolphin that's living in Florida where the water's warmer, um, they aren't going to have that sense of urgency to hurry up and hurry up and hurry up and build a blubber, a blubber layer quickly, not as quickly as they would with belugas. So they will um, stay in these warmer areas, these shallow tidal flats and estuaries such as Cook Inlet, um, you know, until these animals, until the calves get this layer uh, of, of blubber sufficient to let them travel to colder areas. And interestingly, they're born very dark, sometimes even black. They look like charcoal, black, gray, and they will lighten as they get older. So from aerial views, you can often tell when we have juvenile animals, we have the calves, which are really black, and they may be hard to see depending on the water clarity. And then you have these sort of gray, you know, off gray, slate gray animals. And those are the, the you know, sub-adults or young animals, juveniles. And then you finally get to the adults, which will be the, the pristine white color. So here's just some calves that were photographed. The one up top we, you know, we saw earlier, 
this animal is just sitting on a tide ready to go back out so that will come in. The one on the lower left has the fetal fold still. So this was a pretty new calf. Uh, I don't know, they'll probably be within, you know, just a, a few days old. Takes some while for those folds to, uh, to uh, flatten out, to fill in. And then they're quite gregarious. I mean, we've seen them, you know, play around with their moms. They're very, um, you know, they can, they'll flop around and, you know, jump on their moms and do all kinds of things. If they're, if they are uh, threatened by a predator, they will jump on moms too, for various reasons other than just playing. So we've and witnessed that, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner. Um, things that we know about, you know, their distribution, there have been several sources, and one of the oldest and um, most interesting are what we get from traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. And this is from Native peoples, depending on where they are around the world. They've lived with these animals for thousands of years. They've hunted with them, lived with them. It's important to their culture, to their survival. So they've become very adept at knowing where to find these animals, at least in a historic sense. Now, because of you know, changes in climate and just changes in you know, development, what have you, these may change. But even so, they are very a very good source for going to to figure out where these animals been traditionally and where where do you think they've changed and how do you think they've changed since then? Um, certainly opportunistic sightings, at least in Alaska and Cook Inlet, we get reports from fishermen, we get reports from citizens that have been out in boats that come across these whales. So uh, we do get reports of those and there are sighting um, places where you can report sighting information in, in these locations so that you can get uh, you know, citizen science to help keep track of where they are found. Uh, personal accounts where, you know, again, that kind of goes in with the opportunistic sightings. If we have an animal that's, um, you know, been following, been in one place for a long time, and, and so people become familiar with this one animal, or they've, you know, had a new, uh, new, a new group has shown up in their region, and they can report that to, to the uh, natural resource management agencies. Certainly aerial surveys have been very important in different populations around the world. And they continue to be because you can cover such a large area and then develop a general an estimate of the population using correction factors for those animals that you may miss under the water at the time that the, the video is taken or the photographs. Um, tagging has certainly gives us a lot of information on where these animals go in um, Bristol Bay, we did put as part of our health assessments, capturing Bristol Bay animals and doing health assessments. We also put uh, different kinds of tags on them. One, it was a little bit, um, it was a spider tag that would give us longer information. Then we had these little limpet tags that were meant just to stay on for a few hours. And then we can track it via satellite and find out where they're going and, and what habitat should be protected for them um, based on their movements and maybe where their, their prey species are going. The habitat modeling is um, something that is a great tool because it can take a lot of this information that we collect from these first five and then incorporate that into where we think the animals will go based on these factors and also where their prey are showing up. So it's a nice way to take a lot of information and put into it this com a computer program that can then spit out. Now, they're not always going to be 100% accurate, but they are very informative for resource managers or when we're trying to come up with a recovery plan for a population that's endangered. And this map shows us where the range of blue is the dark blue is where most of the populations are found. So they are an Arctic and subarctic species group of animals. They are found along the coastlines of Alaska, Russia, Scandinavia, Greenland, Canada. And they are um, found in coastal waters during the summer, as I mentioned earlier, often in very shallow water. So in, in some areas, we've seen them in a foot of water, so which is pretty shallow. The only two, I don't know if you can see my little uh, marker here, but the, one, the two that are really kind of unusual are the St. Lawrence, Canada, which are in eastern Canada. So they're below the Hudson Bay. They're, they're isolated from the rest of the, the um, Canadian populations. And then we have our Cook Inlet Beluga, which is in Southeast Alaska, and it's also isolated from the rest of the Alaska population. So those two populations are very unusual. Um, so they've had their own, because of being found in sort of urban environments, they have faced their very interesting sets of problems that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so during other seasons, other than the summer, uh, these whales can dive quite deeply. They can go up to 1,000 meters. So it's like 3,000 feet. That's deep for periods of up to about 30 minutes. And that's a long time. So 
Um, they can go deep, they can swim among ice flows in Arctic and subarctic waters where those temperatures can be as low as 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. So they're very interesting um, because when they're not in those deep cold waters, they'll be found in these shallow estuaries, uh, river deltas, where it can be quite warm. So they're well adapted to very different climates. I'm not saying that those river deltas are warm by say Florida standards, but compared to being up in, you know, around the Arctic in the Arctic Ocean, it's definitely warmer. So they've been able to adapt back and forth between these um, two different uh, habitats. Now they have a varied diet, so they um, are quite adept at eating really whatever they can get their hands or their flippers on, their mouths on, but they, there are certain species that they focus on during the summer months in order to build that blubber layer up. Because as you know, that some of these other species like sandworms, um, you know, shrimp, they may not be as, cal as caloric, caloric dense or fat dense as some of these others like uh, salmon, um, maybe not even cod, but like herring, those are the ones that they help to build up their blubber layers. So, but they've been known to eat a whole variety of different things. Um, in Cook Inlet in particular, when they come in from the winter and they've just come at the end of the spring and they're waiting for those salmon runs to start up at the mouths of those rivers up in Cook Inlet, uh, they will feed on eulicon or candlefish, these fish right here. And these are a super high oily, fish that was used at one time and maybe still is in some areas, but they were used before electricity came around to light up um, inside of homes. So they're like, they could burn as an oil lamp. They're that dense with oil. So, um, but these guys are kind of in trouble too, the, the eulicon, and that's very important because these belugas will feed on them as they're coming in, not quite starving, but just on their last fumes from the winter and eating, you know, cod and shrimp and worms that maybe don't fill them up as well. And they are going to lose a lot of their blubber layer in the process until they can get in and refurnish it um, in the spring. But eulicons are one of the first things they'll eat on, eat, and then they'll go to, um, uh, you know, move on to salmon when the salmon come in. And this is really where they put on their, their blubber layer to help them survive the next winter. Yeah, and, and not, I put that, I found this one. I thought that was kind of funny with the pizza. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, the native populations of the Arctic, uh, particularly in Alaska, Canada, um, Greenland, and Russia, they have hunted for belugas for a long time. Like we're talking thousands of years, both consumption and profit. So what I mean by profit is they can, you know, sell scrimshaw, you know, um, maybe bones, and because they are allowed to do that. Um, but they've also, these animals have also been hunted by non-natives during the, particularly during the 19th century and part of the 20th century when, you know, white settlers came through and explorers came through, uh, saw these animals that are hunted, but they are quite, uh, you know, these, the, the native populations were able to get all their nutrition, or at least a good portion of it from utilizing a lot of the animal for instance, the muktuk, which is the big blubber layer, is very high in vitamin C because you think about where are you going to get vitamin C up in these areas. So this is, um, I don't know if anyone's done a, a total body analysis of all the nutrients that come from a from a cetacean like this. I think it would be very interesting to, to know. Uh, but, but, you know, now with Western diets, they don't, some, some will feed on the, you know, hunt these for food, but in some of the pop other populations, like in Bristol Bay, they do have partial Western diets too, which is unfortunate because we know what Western diets do to everybody. So, um, you know, it gives us things like uh, diabetes and other dis chronic diseases. So um, the interesting thing is that small uh, hunting belugas is not controlled by the International Whaling Commission. So each country or region has developed their own regulations. So uh, for instance, like Inuit in Canada and Greenland and then Alaska native groups and Russians are allowed to hunt belugas for consumption uh, because Aboriginal whaling is what it's considered. So it's um, excluded from the IWC's 1986 moratorium on hunting. So you know, they may have their own internal regulations, these groups, as to how many whales they're going to take, but um, it is still, it does still happen, and they still do uh, rely on this important food source for their culture and their nutrition. Uh, like, I would say, like most, probably all cetaceans, there are threats that they face, and there are several, and this list is by no means completely comprehensive, but it's some of the main ones, habitat degradation, whether it's uh, you know, natural resource exploration, like oil derricks or uh, mining, 
you know, development by humans building along coastlines, uh, certainly contaminants, prey limitations. If the if for some reason the prey is either decreased in density or in um, the, the distribution is not the same that can harm these belugas. So if, if for instance, the climate change has caused the water to uptick in temperature, some prey items may not be okay with that. So they'll move out of that region to find you know, more suitable water temperature and that leaves the belugas sitting here. So um, that's something that's a consideration. Certainly strandings, if we had a mass stranding of say the Cook Inlet population, that would be devastating if they couldn't all get back in the water. So if there was something that's other than their natural rubbing on rocks, if there was something that scared them all of a sudden and they all went on the beach and couldn't get off um, on the next tide cycle, that could be a problem for that small population. Certainly noise is one we hear about. And as the Arctic melts more and more, we're gonna have more access to ships and exploration. So that will be a, a concern. And then of course, climate change, which ties into many of these other um, problems, you know, the first five. So that's always something that to think about. So now what I'm gonna do is go from general global talking about belugas down to Alaska. And in Alaska, there are five stocks of belugas. We have the Eastern Beaufort Sea, which numbers around 40,000. The last counts they had were in 2019, um, the aerial surveys. In Eastern Chukchi Sea, I don't think they have any updated, uh, but I think the last counts were like 3,700, but there's not enough data really to update that. They're, the Eastern Bering Sea, the last count was around 8,000, but there's really no indication whether that population is going up or down. The Bristol Bay that I've mentioned is on the, the western side of the, of the Alaska Peninsula, and that has been growing, increasing the population size. It's only about 2,000, but it's still uh, going up. And then we have the Cook Inlet in southeast Alaska, which unfortunately um, has been in the low hundreds. So we'll talk a little bit about them more in a minute. Now, on the eastern side um, of Alaska, up in this area, there's something called Yakutat Bay, and occasionally there will be a few straggling or a few belugas individuals show up there. There's been some genetic studies on it. I don't think the, the picture is clear on that. There was a paper put out a few years ago by Greg Corey Crow, who's the, the big geneticist um, for belugas. So whether it's cook inlet animals going over there or whether it's just a two or three Yakutat animals have just stayed there over the years, it's not really clear. So um, there are some there. It's not considered a distinct population or stock at this point, but I just wanted to mention them because I will mention them again a little later. So now we're going to go in further in Alaska down to cook inlet specifically. And uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, it's a geographically distinct and isolated population, but it's also um, genetically distinct and isolated. So it means it doesn't breed with any of the other populations anywhere in Alaska. So this is a, a, a problem in itself. Um, and I'll show you a graph on the next slide, but the numbers, the high, I think the highest numbers were 1300 in the seventies. And then there weren't surveys done for quite a while. And then all of a sudden in the nineties, they had like a 50% decline in population from 1994 to 98. So they ended up and it just continued to decline. Um, hunting was stopped, so native hunting, all hunting was stopped in, I think by 1999, finally 2000. And then even then it started, it was continued to decline the population level. So by 2008, they listed it as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Now, despite the protection, it was still continued to decline. And this population has suffered a range contraction. I'll show you in a little bit. So what happens, one of the things that it hap that um, sets off when you uh, list an animal under the ESA, Endangered Species Act, is it, it sets off a, a recovery plan development. So the recovery plan was issued in 2016. It does take time to bring all this information together. But what it, one of the things it does is it lists and ranks the threats that may be contributing to the population's decline and thus preventing its recovery. So they listed some high concern threats in this uh, that's number five in this uh, recovery plan. Noise was one of them. Uh, natural disasters, because you think of something like a, you know, a volcano exploding and knocking out a population of belugas that's very small. Certainly cumulative effects when you have accumulation of you know, uh, range contraction or low food or disease or something that's either natural or anthropogenic, i.e. man-made, the accumulation of those effects can be devastating um, in and of itself as a threat to the population. 
Uh, they did list other threats such as pollution and prey reduction. Now the, the recovery plan gets um, revised every five years, at least reviewed. And so these may change some of these ranks, at least right now it's still the same, but that could change in the future. And so the, the, the plan did also document that there was uncertainty that still exists regarding these threats, particularly the ones that are man-made because they're not always easy to directly measure. So pollution can be one, um, noise can sometimes be hard to measure, or if we get some kind of outflow of a pathogen from land, from something way up in the, uh, up in the you know, two miles inland that makes its way down, it's hard to measure that somehow, uh, you know, very um, accurately at, at times. So that that's what makes it really hard to measure these anthropogenic um, threats. So the, the abundance, I don't have the, the 1970s just in the interest of you know, making space for the graph, but during the, the first year is 1994 that's on this graph, but you can see how it kind of dipped down and then it went up a little bit in 95, 96, and then really came down steeply during 1998, by the time 1998 rolled around. So it is continuing to climb. It has little blips where it comes up and then it'll go down, it comes up and then it'll go down. And the last, um, the last estimate I have, it, the, the population has been ranging between 250 and 317 animals for quite a while, um, you know, since probably around 2010. The last um, median that they estimate they have is from 2020. They may have one for 2022. I'll have to look that up, but I don't think yet. Um, it was 279, so 279 animals. So you're coming from the 1970s, that was around 1300, and now you're down to 279. So it's kind of held steady, you know, between 250 and 317. But the point is, is it's not going up. We're not seeing an increase in population like we're seeing with the Bristol Bay animals on the other side of the peninsula. So that's the, that's the problem. Um, they do annual surveys, uh, NOAA does, and um, with help from ADF&G, which is Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, they will go out in the northern part of Cook Inlet where they generally do searches about three to five times in a you know, per year, they'll do some in the, in the summer. And I mean, the spring, they'll do some in the summer. So this is an example of track lines, survey lines from June, 2005. And the, this, the lower left is just some of the equipment that they use. So they're in this airplane, it's one of the aircraft they use. So you're basically flying back and forth, back and forth on track lines, or when you spot a group of animals and you think about in cooking it, the water looks like cafe au lait. So it can be really difficult to see animals if they're not these bright white animals. So you have a high chance of missing gray animals that are subadults, juveniles, and you have a really high uh, likelihood of missing um, calves that are, you know, maybe really dark. So the films that go back are then looked at by people who are trained to do the counts and there are counts that are com they come up with and then there's statistical modeling that helps take into account the, the, the whales that are underwater that are missed and they come up with a, a figure. So now um, the sightings that we, that the, so when they do find on those track lines on the previous slide, when they do find them, they will go ahead and mark a point. And so this is sort of the outcome of uh, belugas from 2005 and where they have seen them the most, they, they rarely see them in the lower inlet. And I'll show you, you know, some maps of how that's changed over the decades in a minute. They typically show up near the river mouth. So we have the Susitna rivers, we have the little Susitna, we have the, the big Susitna. We have an estuary such as the um, shallow estuaries like Knick Arm. We have this shallow bay here called Chickaloon Bay. I always like the names up in Alaska. And so this is Anchorage right here. So you can get an idea of where, where the city is. Uh, Turnigan Arm is an area. There's a highway that runs really close to the water here that you can you know, step out and often see these belugas swimming by. So this just shows you in 2005, they did five surveys and they just put pin drops of where they found these animals. And so they do tend to hang out where they're going to find their food, which is in these river mouths and estuaries. So it hasn't always been that they're not found in the lower half of the Cook Inlet. Back in the 70s, they had um, they had some, uh, you know, some some flying that was done, some aerial surveys, but not consistent. But they also had sightings from you know, from traditional ecological knowledge, from people's observations. And in the 70s, which this map is showing, they pretty much, here's Anchorage up here, they did 
tend to distribute more so throughout the entire Cook Inlet, not so much in the deep, deep south, but from pretty much the you know first upper three quarters of it. Here's Homer down this area. So it was a pretty wide distribution. Now watch carefully. So each of these dots represents a group, a group of animals. And then the size of it depends on how many animals they found. So up in the, you know, still up by the rivers, they're gonna find the biggest groups, but they did find them in other places too. Now we move forward to the 1980s and you can see what's starting to happen. Things are moving up. We're not, so here's again, 70s. And then the 80s, they're starting to move up north. Then we come into the 90s and they're moving further north. Yeah, they still come around here occasional, but they're not like these big aggregations. And then we come in after the 2000s and they're really not present down in the rest of Cook Inlet. Why? That's the big question. It's a $10,000 question. So um, we don't really know. Um, there are theories, you know, the food may be only available there. Maybe there's a decrease in the amount of food. They're just really having to stick by there. There may be something else going on in the lower Cook Inlet that's not conducive to them staying there. It's hard to say. I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know if the Beluga researchers have the complete answer yet. Um, I think there are a lot of theories that are being looked into right now. Okay, so I'm going to see, now we're going to focus on, and the reason I introduced you to all these Cook Inlet animals and the Yakutat is because we have this whale that shows up on October 3rd, I was talking to Howie Garrett and Susan Berta from Orca Network one evening, it was Sunday evening, and they said, oh, we just got this email or message from someone down in, in Commencement Bay in Tacoma, which is in the, the you know, port of Tacoma, and I don't know if you know, Tacoma is a very industrial city, um, the sister city of, of Seattle, and they said they found this whale, this animal that looked white, so I'm going to see if I can get this video to go, it's a little clip, um, let me see. There we go. Uh, I know. Is that oh a minky? Oh my gosh, what is that? Yeah, unfortunately. Hopefully, it doesn't idea. come play with our rudder. No. I think it's, is it a. It can't a be a beluga. Wheel. Oh, that was. Did you see it, hon? No. Come over here. It's, it's like albino, it's white. So you can see in this video, we have the juxtaposition of the, you know, the green trees behind, and we got all these boats and industrial stuff in the front. And these people are like, this can't be a beluga. And that's what we all thought initially, like this can't be a beluga. But um, sure enough, um, it was. And the location of that video was taken right here. So this is the port. Um, this is a river coming out, one of our major rivers, the sediment and silt coming out into um, the port of Tacoma, this big shipyards and you know big industrialized area. But again, you were seeing some of this green area. There's still a little bit of green belt left in that area. But this is the sighting, uh, the pinpoint of the first sighting of this animal uh, down in the Tacoma area. So then we started thinking like, okay, have we, seen have we seen belugas down in Puget Sound before? Let's go back and look. Well, sure enough, in uh, a publication by Victor Sheffer and Slip from 1948 did say that there was a, a record that showed a beluga showed up in 1940 in Puget Sound for three to four months. And we thought, well, maybe there was something in the news about it. So Linda Mapes is a reporter for the Seattle Times who does a lot of environmental reporting and went back and dug up um, the April 24, 1940 edition of the Tacoma Times that said that the it carried the story of some unknown grayish white sea mammal that was seen by locals as page one news that was headed for Olympia, which is our state capital, the base of the Puget Sound, to speak to the governor. So I thought that was kind of funny and it has a sense of humor. But what was interesting is, uh, and I don't remember who gave us this sighting, that back in 2010, there was a, re a reliable report of a beluga that was seen in Saratoga Passage, which is up about um, where the water comes in from the Strait of Juan de Fuca from out in the ocean into Puget Sound, the Salish Sea. And uh, there's a passage there. And unfortunately, there was no photo seen, uh, there was no photo produced. I think it was just kind of one of those things where the, the person saw it and knew it was a beluga, but just didn't have any way to take a you know picture of it at the time. So you know that was a possibility there. So um, what we did is we started putting out the word to start getting sightings. I don't expect you to read all this, but what this is is a really nice uh, spreadsheet of all the sightings we got for the next two weeks after this initial. But we went and looked 
um, the first couple of entries are from, actually the first four entries are from predate uh, October 3rd, which is when it was seen in, in Tacoma. These were up in BC, British Columbia. And so they were heading south. So it was seen up there, um, but it wasn't really reported, you know, like it just was seen once and then disappeared. So that was kind of interesting that it was actually seen earlier than what we saw down here in Tacoma. So on the 7th, so that was um, a few days later, in the meantime, our straining coordinator, Kristen Wilkinson at NOAA had talked to people up in Alaska that studied belugas, NOAA folks, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, because we thought, uh-oh, what if this is one of these cook the beluga animals? Or what if it's a yakutat animal? What do we need to do to be prepared for it? And so there was a lot of scenes. It took a few days for everything to kind of get, um, you know, sending information on how to do photo ID for belugas, which is not the same for other animals with, with dorsal fins. So we set out, we had a crew of um, several people from WDFW, Diana Lamborn. We had several vets uh, from SR3 and World Vets. We had Scott Veers and Michael Doherty from Beam Reach, and then Amy Van Sice, who was from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. We set out with some objectives that day to try to get some photo ID, to try to match images from up north because they have a they have a photo ID catalog in Cook Inlet. Um, we had three vets to kind of visualize it. We felt it was thin, but it wasn't emaciated. So it wasn't like one of those big hefty doe boys that we see um, after the end of the summer. Uh, the behavior though was, was interesting. It was really tough to track this animal. It was erratic. It was going all over the place. It seemed to be drawn to really busy places. It went in and I'll show you some maps of where it went. You know, in the middle of Tacoma, it went to just outside of downtown Seattle. It, it went to you know naval shipyards. So it was it was basically just chasing its food. It was salmon runs were coming in at that time. So we also had a lot of boat traffic out, a lot of salmon fishermen. So it did help us in spotting it. But trying to chase that animal that day was really really difficult. So we said, well, let's try to get um, some hydrophones in the water to see if we can get a sound because there are recordings of the cooking the animals. No luck because excuse me, all we collected was ship noise only. We could not, it was masked. So we couldn't even hear this beluga. Uh, we did though collect eDNA from a water sample. So eDNA was, um, what it is, is you collect environmental DNA from say sloughed skin from the animal. So wherever it travels through, we can collect a water sample in the hope that we've either collected some fecal sample or something that has tissue from the animal that would have DNA in it that we could then, um, you know, try to at least rule out some stocks that it might have belonged to. So what I did that night, so um, we, with the help of our news helicopter, which I'll show you some video in a minute, they were able to spot the animal for us because it was just, it was like whack-a-mole. It was jumping all over the place. We were spending hours just chasing after this animal all over the place with like four boats, five boats. So um, it was really frustrating at that time, but the King Five News found it. We finally were able to have it, it went through, we went through it to its footprint. We got the water. When we got back to shore, I drove it up to, back up to Seattle from Tacoma back up to Seattle, took it to the lab, and they worked um, did, worked on it that evening to then uh, try to identify it, what it was, what it, where it was from, and I'll tell you in a minute. So this is the first week of sighting. So it came down from Canada, um, worked its way through Puget Sound. Here's Whidbey Island, okay, and the south southern tip. This is the Strait of Juan de Fuca, where we have um, the tip of Vancouver Island, the southern tip, and then this is where it goes out to the ocean, to, to the Pacific. So it came all the way down, and it first showed up, the green, green, all the way down to Tacoma. So here's Tacoma, the port of Tacoma. Here's Seattle, uh, right here. So this guy went all over the place. It just went over here. Then it went to Bremerton, which is where our naval shipyards are. It went back over here to downtown Seattle. So it was, but it seemed to prefer this area at the mouth of that river that I showed you where the sediment was coming into the port um, is it's a big fish run up there or down there I should say. This is the second week of sightings it made stops not to say that it didn't show up in these places it's just that we didn't get sightings from those areas. So finally it was last seen a last confirmed sighting right here this last one and I will show you um, some of the results. So the last confirmed sighting on that map it was on the southwest side of um, uh, what Whidbey Island off Lagoon Point. Now the last unconfirmed sighting, which means we didn't have a picture, we don't, can't say 100% sure it was a blue, it was off of Newport, Oregon. So it had left the sound, left the Southern Sea and started its way down. Uh, it was around mid-November. 
Um, we did have contingency plans so in case it was a live stranded and it was a uh, uh, cooking an animal, we could be prepared for it. And if it was a dead stranding, it was going to be you know thoroughly necropsy. So the interesting thing is the public was really excited about this. We just don't get belugas. You know, the last time was 1940 or maybe 2010, the unconfirmed one. But you know, it's, it was a neat thing. People were very excited about. It. They were happy to turn you know bring in um, uh, you know sighting information. Now the sampling. Um, it with this, we were not able to definitively match it to a known family. To do that, we would have to have either skin or feces to definitively ID the stock it came from. However, we do know that we were able to rule out cook inlets. So we're like, phew, you know, it wasn't one of those. It wasn't the Yakutat. Most likely it was an Arctic or Beaufort Sea animal. So that's a long way to go. And I'll show you the proposed route this guy must have taken or girl so coming from the Beaufort Sea it's going to be up in this area here's the Beaufort Sea so we'd say you know around here it occupies western Canada but also um uh you know western and these animals will either travel to eastern to Canada or they'll go west to Russia they don't really take a take a left of the corner here and come down so there's about three routes we have the yellow one if they really wanted to to be safe and stay away from predators. You know, you sneak along the coast and just kind of visit and come down, but that's really heavy um, energy intensive. Could be one of these other two routes. The pink one kind of did that, you know, just kind of straight out south, got through the killer whales down here in the Aleutian chain and then sort of, you know, just hug the coastline. Or we have the really daring one and want to be really fast and efficient just coming straight out here and then cutting across the gulf of alaska we don't know what it did we have no idea um but we do know it went a long way and we were hoping everybody down you know california would see it go by so we could <laughs> keep track but i don't know we'll see what happens um you know if it ever shows up or we ever see this again happening my suspicion is with the with the opening of ice and development there we this might happen again but i don't know so um, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of videos. One is audio, so you can hear why they're called the canaries of the sea. And the other one will play in the background on the last slide, which is the video that King 5 News took. It's really pretty um, footage of the, you know, from uh, aerial perspective. We can answer questions during that time. So let me see if I can play um, this one that has, I have to take it out of this view. Okay, here we go. Oh, sorry, that was me. I was making sure that the, let me turn it back on. I was making sure the share sound was on. Sorry. I just think they're really neat sounding animals. Uh, and the last one we'll do, oops, hang on a second. Okay, so I'm gonna try to um, play this video. It's a long video, but I'm gonna try to fast forward it. This is um, from the air, from the helicopter or news that helped us find the animal finally. And then I'll, um, I'll answer, I'll go to the Q and A section up there and start answering questions. So let me play that. And I'm going to fast forward it because there's a big blank here that happens. Let me move it forward if I can. Oh, I don't think I can. Well, it'll show up again in a few minutes here. But let me ask answer some questions. Oh, it's not going to let me do that. Um, oh, heck. Shoot, I wanted to be able to play this in the background. Um, anyway, you can look up King 5 Beluga video. Puget Sound, and you, it'll be 40 minutes of this, 43 minutes of this. It's really impressive. It's beautiful. And the water was, was a sunny day. It was clear. Um, so you mentioned killer whales. Are they a main predator? They are, depending on where they're found. I don't know about other populations in, um, in other parts of the world, but I do know that they are a concern for the cook and the beluga animals, mainly because they're so such a small population. But yes, they are 
they can pre predate on uh, beluga whales, and there is a publication that that um, has been put out about that. So yes, that's a that's a good question. Um, can I talk a little bit more about the 2020 signing in San Diego? I unfortunately don't know much about that one, other than the fact that it was there for a little while and then it left, and I then there was a uh, a dead beluga that showed up in Mexico a short time later, and they weren't sure if this was the same one. And I heard that the fishermen reported it dead, and then they had not gotten a sample, and then I heard they had. So I don't know, um, unfortunately, um, I don't know about that one. So I was hoping you guys would see this one, but uh, just didn't, I don't know if it just didn't make it down there. Um, can I talk a little bit about how the loss of sea ice is impacting the various populations? Well, I can speak to the um, the coconut animals and also the ones in Alaska, the rest of the ones in Alaska. Yes, it is a concern for a couple of reasons. One um, is, of course, accessibility to the Arctic. So areas that were, you know, they were formerly protected in, uh, now we're going to have potentially more natural resource development competition between different countries. What that resource exploration will be, don't know. It could be mining, deep sea mining, it could be precious metal mining, could be oil, you know, for sure. Um, so anytime you bring in human presence into something, yes, it is going to be a concern. Uh, I know as far as the Cook Inlet, one of the uh, other things that's a concern is the salinity of the water. So when you have warmer temperatures, you have less snow melt, snowpack, you have less water, fresh water going into this, into the upper parts of Cook Inlet. And that's very important for regulating the salinity of the water, they, the environment they live in, because the fresh water, you know, helps regulate that. And if it's off or not producing enough fresh water, then that can adversely affect the animals. So um, those are at least two of the reasons. And then third would be the presence of their prey items. So if prey items are only happy in certain temperatures and yeah. sea surface temperatures are changing or salinity then they may exit or die or not be able to be in quantity sufficient enough to feed this, the population. So um, I think this is gonna be an issue around the globe. It just depends, the specifics depend on where they're found. Uh, good questions here. See, great presentation, thank you. Some other Arctic cetaceans don't have dorsal fins. Do they use this feature similar to blugas? Yes, like the narwhals um, definitely do. And uh, I don't know how they get around with that big tusk. I think I've heard that they all can sometimes poke the ice with it, but I don't know enough about them um, to say for sure. But yes, anytime you can push up and crack that ice, um, there's also the um, the whales, the, the uh, bowhead whales. So yes, they can also do that, but not as much as say the belugas, because the bowheads will, you know, they'll, they'll move and stay ahead of the ice and not necessarily, if they do get trapped, that can be a concern. I know years ago, I may date myself, but when I was a young girl, they had the issue, the incident with the gray whales that got trapped in the ice. And if the ice is too thick, they can't, you know, crack it, push it up enough to make a breathing hole. So they had to do it for them. And I know some of the animals died. Um, but yes, there are other animals that do it. But particularly when it's like moving ice flows or it's thinner ice, not like the several feet thick, they're not going to be able to do that. This is, we're talking, you know, shorter, less thick ice. Um, amazing information well presented. Thank you. Are you going to write a book? No. <laughs> I I had thought about it, but uh, no, I'm helping a friend write his book, but I'm not going to write a book. <laughs> uh, maybe when I'm retired someday, I don't know. Um, why and how do the belugas end up straight on the pebble beaches? So they will, uh, they'll come in as the tides are going out, they'll, they'll rub themselves. Maybe they may be chasing um, uh, prey items, but they'll come out on that and they'll sit calmly so they can withstand the pressure of sitting out. Cause I know that some of the other whales like giant whales can't stand that the pressures too much on their internal organs. And so they can actually go into shock and have uh, organs shut down. But the belugas are kind of developed. They have that wide bottom and then sort of the you know triangle top. And so they're, they're hardier when it comes to standing out a tide cycle. And they couldn't stay out there for days but they can do a tide cycle and then go back in. So if they're rubbing their belly, trying to get off um, uh, if they're trying to get off uh, skin or if they're trying to escape predators and they accidentally get in water that's too shallow, yes, that can be an issue too. So killer whales can't go in to water that's as shallow as a beluga. Like we saw some, as I mentioned earlier, belugas going in about a foot of water and a, there's no way a killer whale could do that because they've, they've got those big giant dorsal or peck fins and they're just too big. Uh, so they do have an advantage, but if they get caught accidentally, they can get stranded. Um, so that wouldn't be wouldn't be good. 
Why do people still hunt beluga whales? Um, they do up in um, up in the northwest corner, like the uh, um, some of the populations. I I want to say the ooh the not the the Chukchi sea animals are because their population is healthier. They are hunted. The cooking are not not anymore. Um, back in the St. Lawrence Blue, uh, and in Bristol Bay, they do hunt them. In fact, when we were doing captures, we took out, we worked with hunters to help us find them because they are so good at spotting them. When a population's hunted, they're going to know when they hear boats coming around, they're going to be staying really low. They didn't come out of the water to blow very obviously like that one that I showed you that first showed up in Tacoma down here. No, they're sneakier. They're, they use stealth. They'll stay really low below the water. And when they blow and, 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 and take an exhale and inhale, you can barely see them. But these hunters have done this, uh, you know, hundreds of years. So they've gotten to know they, these animals know the hunters, the hunters know the animals. So they helped us find the animals that we needed to capture to sample uh, and do health assessments on. So, but they still do eat, they still do hunt them. Not like, it's not like, dozens and dozens of whales but they do hunt them to either you know some will consume them exclusively but often there's also a portion of the western diet that's they also consume uh are there different dialects for different groups of belugas like pods of orcas that's a good question i i don't know um i should know that but i don't actually i would ooh, i don't know that's a good question i i I would think there would be just, you know, slightly different depending on where you go, but I don't think it's to the degree that we hear um, differences in killer whale dialects, but that's a good one. I'll have to look back at that one. That's a good question to look up. Um, when other cetaceans breach, it doesn't beach, it doesn't seem to turn out well for them. How did the belugas survive out of the water for so many hours? And again, going back, they're, they're you know, built in a way to sustain uh, the pressure, like they're, they're, the bottom of them, they're, they're, the platform that they're built on is, is it spreads out the weight a bit. So instead of having, um, you know, all the weight pressure on a very small area, it's kind of spread out over like a triangle, like that flattened triangle. So it provides them a little bit more um, support so their organs aren't completely flattened down. They can't go infinitely out there. They can stay a tide cycle would really be about the max that without affecting their health. If they were to keep going like for a day, then yes, they would have some, some issues um, with shock and, and organs getting compressed down because they can't do it forever. Uh, can belugas and narwhals crossbreed? I believe that there is some documentation or they that's one of the things we've been asking about that one picture I showed you with the narwhal growing in or traveling with them. I do not, I don't know if they've confirmed it, but I think they've suspected it or wondered if they can. Um, I don't know 100% for certain on that. It'd be kind of neat looking though, maybe a white thing with a long tusk. Why don't we have more information from Russian scientists about the Russian beluga populations? Uh, we do in a sense, mostly it's been um, uh, certain certain groups of scientists have published papers. Like you'll find it in the, in the scientific literature. I think you just don't see it a lot in the public literature, you know, the, the um, because there is quite a bit out there that's been published over the years. Uh, but I don't, I think maybe in Russia, you might see more general interest articles on belugas, just not necessarily here. But yeah, there's a big question about, you know, the beluga captures and how they had them in a, in a off -sea pen, um, offshore pen with those killer whales. And um, yeah, that was a, that's the unfortunate side of things that you don't want to see or, you know, you don't want to happen. Um, but I think, you know, some of it's probably not as transparent as we'd like, but they have published the researchers we've worked with have been very open and very um, collaborative. It's just, there may be some that aren't so much, um, more so than you'd ever find in other countries. Um, but yeah, good questions. And I think a lot of it too, it's in Russian still, their, their project. So um, that makes it hard to, to transcribe. Let's see, I have some, and I think we've gone, okay, questions. All right, great. So I really um, appreciate everybody, you know, listening and um, gosh, if we ever have another beluga, we'll know what to do. I don't know. We've had ribbon seals here before too, uh, a few years ago, and that's an Arctic animal. So strange. All right, well, thanks. And I will stop sharing.
take that off. Okay. What a fantastic presentation. I think I, I think we've all learned a lot of information about belugas and, um, you know, people protect what they love. And so this is the year of thinking, um, acting locally and thinking globally. And so thank you so very much for joining us and, um, you know, educating all of us on belugas.